All right, so to this point, we've surveyed element structure, compound structure, the periodic table, and talked about the nature of compounds on the submicroscopic level in terms of molecular versus ionic compounds. We're going to end this unit by talking about no chemical nomenclature. And nomenclature is a touchy subject for students at times because there's a lot of information here to know and it's a lot of kind of systematic, algorithmic, this is how we do things type stuff. Um, there is a reason for that and the purpose of this slide is to try to impart on you um, what some of those reasons are. Nomenclature does serve some valuable purposes. And to highlight that, I wanted to, to bring up this molecule right here. Now this molecule has a systematic name. It also has a common name, which is much more commonly used. The common name of this molecule is benzaldehyde. And the name is not important. The, the specifics of the name are not important for the time being. I just want to highlight to you how knowing the name of benzaldehyde has really helped me think about this molecule, as this is a molecule I've worked with a lot over the years. One thing to note right off the bat is that the textual description of benzaldehyde, what is that? That's 12 letters. 12 letters in benzaldehyde is much more concise and efficient in many contexts than the molecular structure, which is given right here. In fact, this is even a condensed molecular structure where the hydrogens are not shown and the carbon atoms are implied at vertices where two different covalent bonds come together. Again, that detail is not super important to know at the time being, but it does help make the point that the name is much more concise and efficient than the full molecular structure. And an expert chemist can take a systematic name and unpack it into a structure of almost arbitrary complexity. And now with computers having the ability to do this, it's, it's even easier. We can copy and paste or type a name into a, into a computer program that will expand the structure very rapidly for us. The second point here is that nomenclature reflects structure and the other way around. And that's absolutely true in benzaldehyde. In saying that nomenclature reflects structure, we mean that the name points us to important structural features of the molecule. And so, for example, in this molecule, the aldehyde component of the name points to this group of atoms, including the carbon, the doubly bound oxygen, and the hydrogen atom. This is what we call an aldehyde functional group. And it, it points the chemist to understanding that the majority of the reactivity of this molecule and many of its properties come from the aldehyde functional group. So that name, the fact that aldehyde appears in the name, reflects that important structural point that the C, the H, and the O that I've circled kind of behave as a unit and are very important to the properties and reactivity of this molecule. The last point I, I wanted to make is that for, for expert chemists or for people who have worked with a particular compound for a long time, and, and you'll get this way, right? You're, you're already this way with certain compounds. Um, there's, there's a deep association that comes in between the name and the structure and properties of the compound. So for example, benzaldehyde, I've worked with it long enough to know that it smells like cherries. And I'm at the point now where I can see the name benzaldehyde and evoke the smell in my, in my mind just by seeing the name. Now, the odor, of course, isn't that important if we're trying to predict reactivity or do anything like this. But, you know, I also know it's a liquid at room temperature. It's a colorless liquid. I know that if it's yellow, that means it's reacted with something in the air and it needs to be purified um, and, and things like this. And so, and that connection is almost, it's almost emotional. Um, it goes beyond the analytical and really into the realm of emotional connections to molecules. Without the names, it would be much harder to form those kind of deep connections to different types of molecules. And, and names absolutely serve that purpose. One that you're probably familiar with is, is sodium chloride, right? More than likely, having seen this chemical name before and knowing that it's associated with table salt, you have an understanding that the taste 
of sodium chloride is salty. And there's a deep association between the name and that property. It really is a chemical property of sodium chloride that it tastes salty. So the name provides us a, a mental hook to associate structure and properties with on a really deep level, something that goes beyond almost the cognitive. For our purposes in this course, we're going to focus on the idea that chemical names can be derived from algorithms. And the purpose of many of these algorithms has been to kind of encompass all the possibilities, right? That the space of chemical structures is massive, right? If, if we think especially about molecular compounds where we're able to link atoms in different ways and make molecules of arbitrary size and all that kind of stuff, the space of chemical names is massive. And so algorithms help us really systematize how we handle names and allow us to both generate a name from a formula or structure in a systematic way and generate a formula or structure from the name. Going in both directions is important when we're communicating molecular structure. So I wanted to start with some general questions when you're thinking about generating chemical names. The first question you should ask yourself and one that goes back to um, some points we talked about earlier is, is the compound ionic or molecular? And a key thing to keep in mind here is to recall the distinction between metals and nonmetals. Ionic compounds tend to be composed of both metals and nonmetal elements. The reason is when we see metals and nonmetals, we're dealing with cations and anions, and there's electrostatic attraction there, right? Oppositely charged ions, so these compounds tend to be ionic. Molecular compounds tend to be composed only of nonmetals. Since the nonmetals form covalent bonds with one another, whereas the metals don't. When metals bond to each other, they engage in what's called metallic bonding, which we won't talk about here. Once you've decided whether the compound in question is ionic or molecular, let's start with the ionic case. The ionic compound is going to have cations and anions. You'll want to identify which is which. Generally, the cation is listed first, even if you're looking at a formula. Take a look at the metal cation and ask yourself, does that metal form ions of more than one type? More than one charge, primarily, is what we mean there. Plus one, plus two, plus three. This is common for the transition metal elements, for example. If it does, we need to indicate its charge within the name. And then the second point is just to ask, are the ions monatomic or polyatomic? Particularly the, the anion, most commonly. Is it monatomic or polyatomic? And if it's polyatomic, what's the name of the polyatomic ion embedded there? If it's monatomic, how do I take the, the element name and convert it into an ionic form, anionic form? For molecular compounds, Involving the nonmetals, the, the system is a little uh, easier to apply, we might say, but there are some questions that we do still need to ask. Number one, does the compound contain hydrogen, and is the hydrogen acidic? If so, we're going to name this generally as an acid, or almost like an ionic compound, in which hydrogen serves as a cation. Secondly, does the compound also contain oxygen? So an acidic hydrogen plus an oxygen is going to give rise to what we call an oxyacid. And we'll look at the system for naming oxyacids here in a second as well. The simplest case, and where we'll start, is what are called binary ionic compounds. Binary ionic compounds, as suggested by the word binary, just consist of, of two elements, one a cation and one an anion. And so we could write these in general as MX. And you know what? Let's say MAXN, since the numbers of metal cations and nonmetal anions can vary from, from one, could be two, three, even four. To name binary ionic compounds, we start with the name of the metal cation and use a charge state identifier if needed, if we're dealing with one of these cations that can form multiple types of, of ions, multiple charges. And we start with that name, and then we add the name of the anion, replacing the suffix of the element name, if we're talking about a monatomic which we, we would be in a, in a binary ionic compound, uh, and use an ide option here. Once we've got the metal cation name down to name the anion, for monatomic anions, we start with the element name, chop off the end, 
and add an eyed suffix. And for polyatomic anions, we just use the name of the, the polyatomic ion. And the nice thing about this is because the charges imply the relative numbers of cations and anions, we don't need to indicate the numbers of ions within the names. That's going to change when we get to molecular level compounds. That's going to change when we get to molecular compounds. So let's look at some examples of this. So very simple example would be something like, so let's look at some examples of this. So a very simple example would be something like LiBr. This compound contains lithium and bromine atoms. Lithium is the metal, and the charge on lithium cation is plus one. It's a group one element. We could deduce all this from the periodic table. And so we're dealing with an Li plus cation. To ensure electrical neutrality, then the Br must have a negative one charge, and we can also verify this by realizing that the bromine is in the halogen group, group 17, and therefore has forms ions with the charge of, of negative one. To form the name from this, we take the lithium cation and start there, lithium. No need for any kind of charge state indicator because lithium is always lithium plus one. And for Br minus, it's bromine. When the atom is neutral, we take that suffix, the ene suffix, which is found for all the halogens, and replace that with ide to communicate that we're looking at an anion in this compound. And so the overall name is lithium bromide. Now let's look at a slightly more complicated example involving magnesium and this H2PO4 anion that we saw uh, previously in discussions of polyatomic ions. So let's start with the magnesium again. So this is a metal in group two, meaning its charge is plus two, always. So no need for a charge state identifier in the formula, that's nice. And H2PO4, we can either look at the formula and realize that with two of these required to neutralize the Mg2+, the charge of this ion must be negative one, so it's H2PO4 minus. We could also refer back to our table of polyatomic anions and find this and realize that the structure of this anion implies that it has a charge of negative one. Now, how do we name this? Well, the metal is simply magnesium with no charge state identifier. And what about the anion? Well, the anion is dihydrogen Phosphate. It's a phosphate anion with two additional protons, really, to make the charge negative one rather than negative three. And so we add the anion name by adding that entire name to the name of this compound, dihydrogen phosphate. Because of the neutrality principle, the electrical neutrality principle, we don't need to worry about indicating the numbers of ions within this compound. The dihydrogen is important since there are two hydrogens within the polyatomic ion, we need to indicate that in the name. So we end up with three words here, magnesium, dihydrogen, phosphate for the name of this compound. Finally, let's look at an example where we do need to include a charge state identifier. So something like FeOH3. The Fe corresponds to iron and based either, really here we would want to look at the OH anion and realize it has a charge of negative one, again referring back to our table of polyatomic anions if necessary. This implies that the iron has a charge of plus three, and the OH, let's just list that, has a charge of minus one. Now, iron three plus is only one of multiple possible oxidation states for the iron atom, multiple possible charges of cations, we would say, for the iron atom. For that reason, in the name, we need to indicate the charge state of iron, and we do that using a Roman numeral corresponding to the charge. So for iron, it's going to be a Roman numeral three in this compound since the charge of the iron is plus three. So we'll call this iron three, and then the name of the anion is hydroxide. And again, we can get that from our table, we can get that from just knowing that this is the hydroxide anion. Again, no need to list the numbers of ions in uh, the empirical formula of the compound because that's implied by the charges which are built into these names. So three examples of naming binary ionic compounds here. This is pretty straightforward.